Welcome to Hermit Woods, where there's a story in every bottle. Today is a winemaker's discussion on fermenting of vinifera and hybrid grapes, fruit, and honey. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm Bob Manley. I'm the co-founder of Hermit Woods Winery and Deli. I'm pleased to introduce you to four distinguished guests, along with my partners, Ken Hardcastle, who's our winemaker at Hermit Woods, and Chuck Lawrence. And, uh, and joining us, will also be Ethan Joseph, winemaker, and Kenneth Albert, owner of Sherbert, uh, Shelburne Vineyards in Vermont. Sorry about that. Uh, and also joining us is Ash Fishbein. Ash is the mead maker and co-founder of Sap House Meadery in Ossipi, and he's also the co-founder of Hobbs uh, Brewery. And all the way from South Africa, joining us is Craig McNaught, winemaker of Stony Brook Vineyards. Now, the definition of wine differs depending on who you talk to and where they're from. Some would suggest that wine is only made from grapes. Others might see it differently. Regardless of what you call it, I've had the personal experience of consuming the finely crafted beverages that each of these talented winemakers have produced. All of my guests have made outstanding contributions to the world of wine within each of their areas of expertise. Today, I hope we can gain a better understanding of their perspective on what wine is, the wine they produce, and the techniques involved in its production. I hope we can learn both the differences and similarities of the techniques as they apply to the different fermentables being used. I also understand that we are delving into a big topic and that we cannot fully explore in the short time we have together uh, all of the, the details of this subject, but let us see what we can discover. Um, before moving on to my, my uh, uh, panel, uh, just a couple uh, points here I wanna make. If you're just joining us, please uh, put your name in the comment section so that we know you're here. And like the video or share it with your friends if you know there are others who might be interested in seeing this presentation. Um, also, if you have questions, we'd love it if you'd ask us those questions in the comment section as well. Um, we will do our best to respond to those questions during the video. But if for some reason we are not able to get to all of your questions during the video, um, I will ask all of our guests and, and, I, and I myself will uh, visit the feed after the, the broadcast is over, and we will make an effort to answer all of the questions uh, in the short term. So uh, I think with all of those details aside, without further ado, let's uh, begin the discussion. And uh, I'd like to open the discussion by asking each of our guests to offer a brief introduction um, uh, of, of who they are, where they're from, and to give us their definition of what wine is. Who would like to begin? Don't all jump at once. Jump <laughs> <Ken>. in here. <laughs> so uh, my name is Ken Hardcastle. I'm the winemaker at Hermit Woods Winery. And I think as most of you know, we craft a wide range of, of wines from mostly fruit, also using some vegetables and flowers, honey, sap. Uh, we make mead, we make hard cider, a variety of things. and um, I got involved in this for myself, really got started in 1990 with brewing beer as a home enthusiast. Um, and then I branched out into mead in the mid 90s and then started exploring a variety of wines from grapes and from fruits and materials in the early 2000s. We didn't start our commercial winery until 2010. I'm always um, intrigued by the products that you can get from fermenting the various materials that, that grow well around here. But wine to me is a very special experiential product. And I still remember the first exceptional experience I had was with a little bottle of uh, 1961 Clos de Bougeau that I had in the late 80s that just blew my mind. It's made from 
you know, little Pinot Noir grapes that grew so wonderfully in Burgundy, and I'll never forget that. That's, um, that's just um, one of the key things about wine for me. Thank you, Ken. Craig, would you like to, to go next? Sure. Yeah, my name's Craig McNaught. I'm the, the winemaker at Stony Brook Vineyards all the way out in, in South Africa. Not sunny South Africa today. It's pouring down with rain behind me. Uh, yeah, I, I joined our family business in 2011 as winemaker. Uh, had no intention of joining the business while I was uh, young and full of energy. And I think I saw, I saw the value that, that wine had to add to, to my life uh, a little bit later on. Uh, yeah, like I said, decided to get involved in 2011 and haven't really looked back since then. Um, for me, wine, wine is just a, a fantastic way to explore the world and to, to really get a, get a sense of different cultures in, the, in a wine glass. It's, uh, it's something really special. And, and for me, uh, it's, it's a way to, to always be learning about something. And, and wine is one of those things that I don't think we will ever fully understand from, from a science perspective. I think there is still so much to be discovered. And that, that's really what gets me up in the morning is that there's still so much to learn and so much applied to to the wines that I'm trying to make and uh, I'm trying to share with the rest of the world. Thank you, Craig. Ethan from, uh, from Shelburne, would you like to go next? Yes, hey everyone. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm Ethan Joseph, the uh, wine grower at Shelburne Vineyard. Um, been, been working in, in my current capacity there since 2008. Um, Kind of like Ken, my intro to, to things fermented was uh, as an avid home brewer of beer and cider. Um, started working with Ken, you know, while I was a student at the University of Vermont and really just started to develop a, a keen interest in the agricultural side of, of, uh, of winemaking um, and had the opportunity to, to come on and, and work full time with Ken, spent a lot of time learning from him in the beginning. and. I really just dove in, you know, since then and committed, committed myself to it. Um, and, you know, similarly, you know, wine for me is, 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 uh, is kind of a, a, a broader, um, kind of a bit more esoteric term, you know, in terms of a definition, you know, I don't like to get down to the nitty gritty of like technically what, what it is, but, you know, it, it has that, that strong cultural component. Um, anything that you're taking and fermenting and, and really telling the story and specifically telling the story of the land and kind of the agricultural component to it is, is, is really what defines it for me. Thank you, Ethan. Kenneth, would you like to share your story? Hello, everybody. I'm uh, Ken Albert, the, uh, the founder of uh, Shelburne Vineyard. And uh, we started it, I guess it's 20, 21, 22 years ago. Actually, before that, I guess my introduction to wine was a bottle of Bolio Cabernet Sauvignon back in the uh, probably the late 60s, which uh, sort of opened my eyes up to the possibility that I guess you could make and grow grapes and make good wine in, uh, in North America. So little did I know that I'd end up uh, being, uh, that was when I was living in New York State, uh, I, I was working for IBM and ended up in uh, Burlington, Vermont, actually Shelburne, Vermont, which is a suburb of Burlington right on Lake Champlain. And uh, somehow, I guess that was the bug that, that bit me. So when I retired from IBM, I, I started this, uh, this venture. And uh, initially we used uh, hybrid grapes that were uh, what they call French American hybrids, uh, hybridized by the French uh, a century ago. And then we learned about the uh, Minnesota hybrids, which are very similar to the, uh, to the French American hybrids, except rather than using North American grapes that originate in the northeastern part of North America, they use grapes that originate in the central part of North America, particularly Minnesota. And not only are they hardier than the French American hybrids, but we think they make uh, superior wine. And, and that's where the adventure basically really took off when we learned about Minnesota hybrids. They yield a reliable crop every year. And as far as the details of those, I'm gonna let uh, Ethan, when we get into that part of it, describe some of the challenges 
and some of the unique advantages of using these, uh, uh, these hybrids. As far as wine goes, uh, my vision of wine is it's, it's, I think, the uniquely most complex tasting drink that one can uh, encounter. And I think that's part of the magic, besides the magic that it takes to make it. Thank you, Kenneth. Chuck? Oops. Hi, uh, I'm Chuck Lawrence, um, one of the uh, trilogy founders of Hermit Woods Winery here in uh, Meredith, New Hampshire. And um, I, you guys have uh, prompted a lot of thoughts about, uh, you know, the, the origin of wine. Uh, for me, I guess the word would be terroir. I think what's exciting about what we've evolved into is expressing the flavors uh, that are prolific and grow indigenously, um, and if not even naturally here in our area, and then condensing that into, you know, a great wine experience. To me, wine is... I, I think sort of uh, like Craig said, it's, it's experiential, it's, it's, it's worldwide, and it, it's something that um, expresses who we are, where we are, it's a time and a place. It's, it's much more magical than just a, a, a bottle of chemicals having some sort of uh, reactions over time. It's, it's the dynamic is just what's the, the um, exciting part to me for, for example, uh, the wines that we made 10 years ago that we've opened up in, in during this pandemic and shared with people have just been fantastic and changed and evolved. And, and it's, it's just such a great experience to, to have had these projects and have such, such cool results. So even the, the failures and successes, it's been great. Thanks. Thank you, Chuck. Ash? Good morning, everybody. Uh, Ash Fishbein. I'm co-founder of Sap House Meadery and Hobbs Tavern and Brewing Company in Ossipee, New Hampshire. Uh, my cousin Matt and I started uh, Sap House Meadery back in 2009 and 10. Uh, so we've been in it about a decade and our whole company is based and built on what we call a triple bottom line. And that's community, sustainability, and then profit. So we're very community driven. Sap House Meadery is our vehicle to revitalize and spark uh, new opportunity in our downtown area. Sustainability side of our bottom line is that we use everything locally sourced, fair trade and organic uh, as often as we can as we scale. It's certainly a difficult thing to do, but we make it happen as best we can. And then lastly, we have to be fiscally responsible or profitable. And what we do is we actually give back to our team uh, by offering full benefits. Um, as far as what wine is to me, wine is mead to me. Uh, I love wine. It takes a good wine to make good mead. I can say the same for beer. Uh, but ultimately, uh, we've all kind of mentioned worldwide, global, all those things. And, and terroir is extremely important to me uh, when it comes to mead because bees literally travel. So you constantly have a changing uh, environment, which equals a change of uh, geographical location, which equals a change of flavors, nuance, aromas, and things like that uh, in the glass. So um, I know I'm not, I'm not uh, a wine maker. Um, I've made wine. I love it. Uh, but I can definitely speak to the honey and water side of things, utilizing a lot of local fruits. Uh, we do have some meads with grapes involved, but uh, generally speaking, mead is our, is our world. And just to uh, further that that uh, thought, uh, honey wine is also a name that people use to describe meat. So in a sense, uh, it's a wine. That's right. Yes, by, by technicality. <laughs> Thank you, Ash. So I'm going to just throw this next question out there. And anybody who uh, would like to tackle it, please, uh, please just jump in. Um, now we've talked sort of the generalities around wine. I'd be interested to know, uh, how do you know when you're tasting a really exceptional wine? Or what is it about the beverage you're drinking when you, when you realize, wow, this, this is something special? What defines that? I'll jump in there, Bob. Um, yeah, so I've, I've obviously tasted a fair number of wines since I, or even before I joined the uh, the business. And what what I found, and I'm normally tasting wines in a fairly uh, 
fairly technical environment where there's a, a lot of people and, and not much talking and you're, you're just sitting and focusing on the wines in front of you, you're, write, you're writing down what comes into your, into your mind. And, and funnily enough, a, a trend that I've noticed, at least with my, own, with my own experiences, is that the fewer words I write about a wine, the more impressive it generally is. So if I go back and look at the wines that I've scored sort of you know, 95 points plus, I've always only written about three or four words about them because there is nothing that stands out in terms of there are no edges in the wines. The wines are balanced, they are completely harmonious, and they can be very difficult to describe. So for me, that's, that's really important. And, and it also uh, that plays into, into my role here. I always try to make wines that are completely balanced. You don't know where the acidity stops and the mouthfeel starts, or where the mouthfeel starts and the tannins and the finish uh, come into play. It should all be one harmonious experience. And for me, that's, that's when I know I'm tasting pretty world-class wines, is, is that those edges are not clearly defined. Thank you, Craig. That's a, that's a, that's a good point. And, and I agree. I, I know in my own notes sometimes that um, <clears throat> I'm sort of um, dumbstruck by, the, by what's been forming and developing in the, in the wine. And I don't have words that, that really capture that, trying to trying to think about, okay, I'm gonna come back to this six months from now or six years from now, I wanna look back to see what the, the sequence of events that led up to this wine. But sometimes even early in the ferment, you know, when you're, when you're tasting things and seeing how it's evolving, there are times when I, when I know something has been set in motion it, and it was set in motion, you know, years, millennia, <laughs> hours beforehand, and it's now coming into shape and it's, it, it's, it almost tells you right then and there, very early on, that, that this is going to be a superb product in the end. And that that's, doesn't happen all the time. You can be doing a, a fairly similar process or procedure, and, and every once in a while, those things strike you as being really exceptional. And then as they evolve, that's usually what ends up going into the bottle and then aging out beautifully. That's been, been my experience. Thank you. Anybody else have a, have a thought on that question? Uh, yeah, I, I can just say that, you know, when I think for, for me, especially so when, when you just have this like mental pause, it's like this deep, this deep emotional response where everything kind of just, just freezes. Um, I mean, and it could be in, in a, in a, in a more technical setting, you know, like Craig was describing tasting wines more technically or, or even when, you know, you're drinking wine uh, amongst friends, you know, you, you have that sip and it's just like, you just, you almost like just can't process it all. And it only, it happens only in like a, you know, very quickly. It's not like you get lost in time for an extended, an extended period, but you just have this very immediate and, and very powerful uh, emotional, emotional response that kind of just just makes you just stop and, and check yourself and, 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 you know, you have that moment of, of realization that, wow, this is really something special. That's great. It, you know, it's, I, I'm, if I was to be answering this question, parts of each of what everybody has said so far would have been in my answer. And it's, it's, uh, it's really fascinating to, to see how, how, uh, but but we're from all different worlds and from all different parts of the world, and uh, and very similar ideas. So it's it's very that's that's cool. Ash, do you have a comment? Uh, yeah, I mean, just to add to it, I think everybody here kind of spoke really well about what happens. I mean, no one's mentioned the audible click that you get uh, to know that you're drinking a really great wine. But I'm teasing, of course. The the uh, I th I think that. Um, for me, it's, uh, everyone knows I'm long winded and I talk a lot when I taste something that is absolutely amazing and perfect. I think I take great pause and I, I just stop dead in my tracks. And, and I mean, I, I could be with people or without, but thoughts even stop sometimes. And you're just like, wait a minute, what was that? And it, it's just absolutely fascinating how that occurs. But I share, uh, the same uh, sentiments as everyone else. Yeah, I thank you. Just just a comment, uh, echoing I think what everyone has said. I mean, there's many many times I've had a wine. I say, oh, what a wonderful finish! Or, oh, it's just a beautiful 
feeling sort of as I swallow it or something. And then there are those few lines that the whole experience is integrated together. And those are the great lines. And it, it's very hard to exactly describe those, but uh, I've had a few of them, not many. Thank it's, you. It's a little bit, it's a little bit to me at times like uh, experience with music. A lot of music, you know, you have catchy tune or a fun phrase or aspects of it that are really enjoyable. And then there are those performances or experiences or moments when you are just taken away by the music and it 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 overwhelms you and it, and it consumes you and engages you in a way that you can't really fathom or, or understand or, or even begin to try to articulate. Yeah, I love that sentiment, Ken. I think that's so cool. And I, I, I resonate with that completely. Um, the music analogy works so well because you know, there are, there are two deep fruity wines that are really nice now, but is that the same wine you're gonna to wanna to drink tomorrow night and on Thursday night and on the weekend? But the really exceptional wines are the wines that don't necessarily grab you immediately for any particular reason, but you know they're special because you would want to drink it tomorrow and you'd wanna drink it on Thursday night and you wanna drink it next week and you want a case to lay down for another 10 years. Yeah, I really love that analogy, very cool. And to add to that, Ken, I, I, I like that analogy a lot. As a musician, I always say that music is the sound of feelings because you can create them, right? I think maybe we've stumbled upon the taste or flavor of feelings, right? I think you can get a lot of translation through the final product uh, to what was intended by the wine or mead maker uh, or brewer along the way. Well, thank you. That was a, that was a good discussion. Um, I'm going to really throw a broad question out there next for everybody. Um, it's very general and I just take it as you will. So I'm interested to know as winemakers, what do you find most com compelling about your contribution to the winemaking process and the finished products that you produce? No takers. No, I'll I'll uh, I'll start with that. Um, you know, as I said uh, in the in my introduction, you know, the that wine for me is is you know largely um, this translation of of uh, of an agricultural this direct translation of an agricultural product. I think that for me is is what I find just most interesting and fascinating that. You know, we work 20 acres of grapes here in the Champlain Valley of Vermont, and we tend our vine. You know, we tend the vines all year round, and then harvest. You know, you get one harvest a year, and you have that single opportunity to really just encapsulate that entire uh, that entire season, which you know, as we all know, can be dramatically different from year to year. And then, you know, you have your own emotional. Um, you know your own emotional state of mind that that fluctuates from year to year as well and i think when you at the end of the day or at the end of you know when when that vintage is brought in just being able to revisit those those wines you know during elevage and then once once they're in bottle and and being able to look back uh and and kind of be transported back um you know to to everything that went into that to that finished product is um is what I find, you know, most compelling about, about the wines that we make. Thank you, Ethan. Someone else? It's, um, it's a really exciting thing. I want to jump on what Ash was talking about before with working with honey and this dials into Ethan's comments about the, the agricultural product that, um, you know, with, with any, with any fruit, um, where you have a, a single harvest, per year, let's say. One of the things that's enjoyable to me anyway is working with different fruits that come ripe at different times. So you're, um, I'm looking for strawberries a few weeks from now and, and rhubarb is coming ripe and then soon we'll have some peaches. So there's this, there's this continuum. Each one of them is being impacted by the environment in that season for that production. What's really unique about honey that I love is that as the flowers evolve during the seasons, the honey that's being put up in the hive changes. So with as a, as a mead maker, and I'm sure Ash can really run with this, is that 
you have different honey at different times from the same hive. So it's sort of a continuum tracking of all of that, that symphony of, of productivity that's happening in the, in the biosphere. And it's really fascinating to, to translate these different varietal honeys into, into a wine. Symphony, uh, back to the music example. <laughs> I, I think Ken is absolutely right. Um, one of the things I, I love to geek out on is, uh, and I alluded to it with the bees early on, is traveling. But I also uh, absolutely love, as an ingredient, monofloral honey. Um, and I think that's something that uh, up here in New England, we have just a lot of wildflower. You can find clover, you can find alfalfa, but generally speaking, the majority is wildflower. And uh, what's amazing is what's not in season here could be in season at other in other geographical locations. So grabbing honey, say, from uh, Hawaii, whether it be uh, Lahua or um, uh, macadamia nut honey, or going to Pacific Northwest and grabbing meadow foam uh, or mesquite in Arizona, uh, I feel as though... Uh, blessed to be able to travel without traveling and grab those flavors as we go. And uh, because I do travel quite frequently, uh, I get, I'm bombarded um, almost uh, involuntarily with ideas based on flavors of the locations that I, I'm afforded to travel to. Ash, I've got a, a question for you. Um, when it comes to the, the bees and, and depending on what what they are busy pollinating. Do you get a direct relationship between that flower and the honey and then a direct translation from the honey to the meat? I mean, is there a, is there a tangible flavor component that sort of follows that thread from the flower to the bee to the honey and then into the meat as well? That is my favorite question. Yes, uh, it happens uh, every, every single time. So uh, a great example is, uh, especially with uh, New Hampshire or New England honey, we have a lot of clover. And if, if that's in bloom, you can tell you have clover honey because it has a distinct cinnamon flavor. Um, if you go to um, uh, Pacific Northwest, I mentioned meadow foam honey earlier, you'll know you have meadow foam honey because it tastes like uh, fluffernutter or toasted marshmallows. Um, and you can, you'll know it distinctly uh, what it is. Um, I do a lot of work with uh, the Honey and Pollination Center at UC Davis and work with them and they have a, a honey flavor wheel that was developed based on monoflorals. And that's been something that I absolutely love. As a mead maker, one of the things that, that I kind of run it as a program at Sap House is pairing monofloral honey meads, traditional monofloral honey meads with pre-spirited oak barrels. And a quick example, would be taking a blueberry blossom honey. Now, it doesn't taste like blueberries. It tastes like flowers of the blueberries. And it's extremely vibrant. Uh, you can almost taste the freshness and the color of white, if that makes sense. It sounds a little, little crazy. But once we ferment that, we aged it in a brandy barrel. And having those two meld together absolutely complement and bolster each other up. And so, in short, to answer your question, yes. You get a distinct flavor from, from time of year, as Ken had mentioned. Here, spring honey is very clear, uh, and in the fall, it's very dark and vegetal. Um, and you'll know that as you go throughout, uh, throughout the season, so yes. Any other comments on that question before I move on to my next one? I have one thing to say, maybe you guys can help me remember, but uh, we went and visited a winery in the Sierra Nevadas of uh, California on one of our trips, and the winemaker, Gordon Bierenstock? Gideon Beinstock. Gideon Beinstock, thank you. Um, and so we went out and looked at his organic grapes growing, his grass growing, it's all sort of helter-skelter, and he said, you know, we're, we're talking about making wine. He said, well, this is where the wine is made right here. I'm like, wow, okay. Uh, of course, he's all organic and whatnot. And he said, well, we wanted to go see his wine cellar. And it's like, well, I don't really know why you want to see that. There's really nothing there. And we walked in and literally it was just, really was nothing there. He doesn't do anything. He, he doesn't have any sanitizer. The, the place is not spick and span. 
and um, you know, he just had fermenting tanks and all of, all, all of his wine is made out in the vineyard in his terroir of the, of the, the growing was, was the thing that he really, he really uh, hung his hat on and the proof is in the bottle. I mean, it, it seemed to defy logic to me that he could get away with uh, the sanitary practices that he did, but you know, he had really outstanding wines and uh, high valued wines and wines that are in, in, have been popular in the, in the wine world and, and restaurants and whatnot. So I, I'm really, I was really impressed with that. Although I have to say that it's my impression um, that a lot goes on in fruit wine making because we're blending a, a lot of different flavors together to come up with an end product. So uh, fruit wine is definitely a little bit different animal relative to that sort of philosophical approach to, to, to wine making. That's a, a good lead into my next question, Chuck. Thank you. And, uh, and I should add, Gideon Bienstock is nationally known, uh, probably internationally known for some of the wines that he makes. And uh, it truly was amazing to, to meet him and discover, discover how, he, how he approaches wine. In fact, he would be a great addition to this conversation. Um, my next question is really at the heart of that, uh, nature versus nurture. As we all know, many of the, the variables that go into a fine wine uh, from mother nature uh, uh, to choices that you make in farming and harvesting uh, to the input that is made in the cellar by, by the winemaker. And I'd be interested to hear from you as to what you feel is the, the most significant impact on the final product. Is it mother nature? Is it, is it, uh, is it nature or nurture? Uh, is it your role in the cellar? What, there's, a, there's a lot of talk about this and I'd just be interested to hear how all of you fall on this subject. I know this is a big one, so <laughs> somebody jump. If I could, um, one of the, I think one of the key things for us, and I, I can't speak for grapes again, but I think it's very similar uh, because we're all going for the same same thing is the sugars. Uh, I, I believe, you know, uh, a little stress is always good. I think as entrepreneurs, we feel that way too. Um, and then uh, also, one of the things we look for in our business model is that community sustainability side is having uh, great care for the agriculture one's producing. And uh, I know Hermit Woods and Sap House have shared uh, a resource in, in uh, Wayside Farm with their honeyberries or their raspberries. And I think we can all agree that that is a perfect, Ben is a perfect definition of what a winemaker uh, or a uh, fruit winemaker or a mead maker is looking for in the in the procurement of great ingredients because ultimately it starts there if you start with with lackluster or inferior ingredients you're, you, there's a greater possibility for the exposure of an inferior wine or something you could have made better and i think ben is a great example of that so for me, one of the things I always look for and ask for, I don't always get it, but I always ask for it, is uh, prior to harvest, a minimum of seven days of no rain. And what I'm trying to do is bolster that sugar content. If I'm gonna, if I have to pay by the pound, I want the majority of it to be what I'm looking for. Um, and I find that to be great success. And it's actually uh, challenged a lot of the growers we work with, what I, which I think excites them because it can, uh, like all things, become a bit monotonous. And to give them a challenge uh, like that, I think they find great enjoyment in that. Ethan or Craig, can you speak to this? You, you both are involved in, in the, the full range from, from farming all the way to, to bottling. So what is your thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I, I don't know if, if I could choose whether it's uh, nature versus nurture, there's obviously a bit of both. It's a real balancing act. Um, I would say in, in a poor vintage, if you're able to make good wines, you uh, congratulate the winemaker. And it's the, I suppose that the opposite is also true. If you manage to take a good vintage and make poor wines, it's the winemaker's fault. Um, but uh, yeah, the, you, you kind of have a responsibility as a winemaker to guide good grapes into good wines. Um, it's, it's not always an easy thing. Uh, and I think in a place like South Africa, I think maybe a lot of France is quite different where you're often dealing with 
maybe not perfect conditions, but certainly good conditions for growing grapes. You end up with, uh, with normally pretty good pHs, good acid levels. You've got healthy wines pretty much the whole way through. In South Africa, we're obviously dealing with generally quite, uh, quite warm conditions. Often if we let our grapes get to full phenolic ripeness, we, we sit with quite high pHs. So yeah, I think, I think it's a bit of both, but I, I do think the winemaker's role is, uh, is incredibly important, but it, it all depends on, on context and I think where you are in the world. Uh, yeah, and you've, you've got to, like I said, responsibility as a winemaker to, to make great wines out of good vintages, but I think you've also got a responsibility to try and reflect a sense of place. Uh, and that means really treating your grapes with, with minimal intervention, but just making sure that that minimal intervention doesn't mean that you're creating inferior wines. Yeah, I, I agree with Craig. You know, we there's a lot of romanticism that we attribute with with wine and and I am certainly, you know, I, I, I take that, I, I participate in that uh, myself, but the, you know, if, so if we, if we, if we go down that, that train of thought and like Chuck said with the, with the gentleman in the, in the foothills, you know, there's a lot of talk about how wine is made in the vineyard, you know, although, you know, literally, and maybe that example, but, you know, less literally, uh, you know, in other in other ways it's it's we say that people say that you know we wine is made in the vineyard and i take and i myself take take that position um so you know obviously on that side of things you know we have the the season the seasonality and 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 nature being a, a major uh uh influence but you know there's there's an infinite number of decisions that we make in the field you know to to deal with the different things that that come our way in terms of of the climate and the weather um but then you know so if we if we have a if we have a great vintage and we have we can only make great wine from from great grapes so you know if we if we take if we keep going and you know say that the wine is made in the vineyard well that's really only half the half the story because we, we you can screw it up in the winery so if it's if it's junk on the other end, it wasn't made in the vineyard. You know, it was made in the winery. So you really have to have that. You have to have that balance. You have to have that continuity. You have to have a really careful, diligent hand. At, you know, as a winemaker, like Craig said, just being you know, you know that that minimally involved. Um, although even you know that, that that's a that's a tough one too because you know we we make our wines. I would say it's an easy thing to understand. We minimal in, in intervention but we're very we intervene in a not necessarily like a technical kind of additive way but we we you know we'll give something air or we'll smell it we'll taste it we'll move it we won't move it we won't you know we're patient so there's there's a lot it, that's all to say that you know you make it in the vineyard you make it in the winery you have that balance you just have to be very very, very attentive, very astute in the winery, um, and just kind of, you know, be, be, be light-handed, um, but smart. Yeah, you know, Mike, just a comment on uh, your description of Gideon Beanstalk. I don't think he gives himself enough credit for, I mean, there's so many decisions that have nothing to do with technical issues. I mean, how long do you, do you ferment whole clusters, do you, you crush it partially, do you leave some stems? Those are decisions that a winemaker makes and uh, it, it, it's basically something that happens in the winery, not, not, in, not in the growing of the grapes. Uh, how, long, how long do you, do you macerate uh, before, before you crush it off the skins? Uh, thousands, uh, not even hundreds, but I mean, daily decisions like that. And, uh, but what to do, when do you aerate, when do you not aerate, and when do you taste it, when do you not smell it. So uh, I, I think it's, it's, it's definitely both. Uh, you gotta grow the grapes correctly. You have to know when to do leaf pulling, when to not do leaf pulling, when to do uh, thinning of uh, secondary uh, buds, et cetera, et cetera. There's all those little decisions that are 
you know, for natural wines or, or indeed for even the most uh, uh, factory driven wines that, that are made, I think across the spectrum, I, I think it's both in the, in the vineyard and in the winery. Yeah, just to add to that, you know, that, that whole concept of terroir, you know, it's largely attributed to, or we, we largely associate it with, um, with place and geology and soils and, you know, more so like just, you know, the fungal soil organisms and that sort of thing. But what gets lost in that when we, when we talk about it at, at uh, from that perspective is, um, you know, the people that are, that are, that are growing the grapes and making the wine. And I think, you know, we as producers are, you know, equally important in defining um, each of our specific terroirs, you know, as, as the places, you know, you can have the same grapes from the same piece of land made in the same way by different people. And I think the influence of an individual can have an impact uh, on, on the wine. Yeah, ab absolutely. I, I, I really liken um, producing wine as, as parenting, as, as raising a child. There's so many, and it's a perfect nature nurture sort of combination. There's a whole bunch of material that's, that's presented to you from the world. And then as a parent, you can intervene as much or as little, and you can make all those numerous choices you do every, every day with whether you intervene or, or not. And, and the goal is to still produce the best product that you can in one way, raising your child or producing this, this beautiful wine. I love that analogy actually. And it, it carries right on through to, to college, I think as we discussed the other day. <laughs> No, I also, Ken, if you could speak to uh, the, the idea that you often refer to as building a grape. So in the, in the world we're living in at Hermit Woods, we, uh, we're using fruit that's farmed often by other farmers. Uh, I think similar to, to what Ash was talking about earlier and having to rely on the farming skills of others. Um, although they, they may take direction from us, they ultimately are responsible for the fruit that arrives at our door. And, uh, and then Ken working with different fruits, uh, often fruits that aren't typically recognized as fruits you would make wine from, um, but, but with the task of figuring out how to, how to pull together those, the, the right components to build a grape. And I may talk more to that. Yeah, I think, I think that's both, both, both Ash and I are sort of assemblers of, of grapes, if you will, of our fermentables, unless we're doing a, a straight varietal honey or a straight varietal cider, um, we're trying to build something unique and, and, and complex and engaging that you might get from a single varietal like, like Pinot Noir or Syrah in a particular area, that single grape may give you a tremendous product. And um, in, the, in the grape world, often blends provide you that opportunity to, to fill a hole or to round something out or to provide a, a more pleasing format. And, and I try to do that same thing, but instead of blending a little bit of, of uh, Semillon with, with my, my Saint Blanc or something, I'm working with, uh, with rhubarb to add some, some acidity to the sweet lusciousness of the strawberries, and I'm adding some wild blueberries to, to provide some antioxidant and some, some richer coloring stability to the product. So I sort of as, assemble a, a collage of materials that will affect what a, a well-grown grape or, or combinations of grapes they bring to the bottle. That's the way I sort of, of think of it. So I don't, I don't grow my wine in a vineyard, I, I assemble my grapes from a variety of sources around the area. Any other comments on that topic? Yeah, so Ken, it sounds like your, your job is sort of treading the, the line between alchemy and winemaking. Um, but just c coming back to, to the previous points of uh, you know how how important the, the winemaker is, and and uh, 
uh, versus climate or terroir, um, I thought it might be nice to mention to you guys. I'm part of a project called the GD1 project, which uh, which is a, a group of, of like-minded winemakers in, in our valley in France. And we all, every year, uh, for the last two years, we've we've gotten our hands on one single vineyard of Semillon. And we've divided that vineyard up between the 11 of us. And we've each tried to make uh, a Semillon in a very similar style uh, to eventually put, uh, put a blend together into, into a bottle. And I actually tasted all 11 of those samples on Tuesday, all with a Everyone had a very clear directive of what they were supposed to do with the wines. And it is unbelievable how we could all take the same grape and process them in almost an identical way and put 11 completely different personalities into those bottles. I mean, there were some of them that you, you couldn't even identify that they were semi-on driven wines. It, they were so radically different. So yeah, I think just coming back to, to the idea of is, is, it, is it winemaker, is it climate, is it, uh, is it, mother, is it nature, is it nurture? It's, it's definitely a, a bit of both. Hey, Craig, on that, on that note, that's a fantastic experiment. What's your feeling on what are the primary drivers of those differences? Is it the, is it the makeup of yeast in each one of the uh, cellars where people are making their wine? Is it specific physical constraints like like temperature or punch downs or, or, or fining regimes? What, what are your feels for what, what's created those differences? Or maybe it's the music they're listening to while they're crafting their wine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, I think coming back to what Kenneth was saying is that there are so many thousands of variables that a winemaker deals with every single day. And I just think it's a combination of those. I mean, every decision you make in the winery with every single wine is going to impact quite heavily on, on the wine that you produce at the end of the day. So to try and give you an answer saying, oh, you know, it might be the thiols that are produced by this yeast, or it might be the fact that this winemaker did more, did more butternage on the wine, or this temperature, uh, the ferment temperature was slightly lower in the cellar. It is definitely a, a combination of all of those things. And I think that's how personality really comes out in wines. And that's how winemakers really speak through their wines. I, I want to talk a little bit about about additives. Uh, this is another sort of hot topic in the industry, and uh, be interested to hear your perspective. And and what is the difference between an additive and an ingredient, if you will? So, uh, talk up a little bit. Do you use additives? Why? And if not, uh, why not? And then uh, and then talk a little bit about what what for you differentiates that from say an ingredient that you would used to make your wine. Is that directed at me, but was that just a general question? Um, well, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a very brief uh, understanding of, of how we view it. For me, the only ingredient is great. Uh, everything else that you do with the wine is an additive. You, you really want everything else to be as neutral as possible, I suppose. Um, that's why we use stainless steel a lot. Um, but for me, yeah, everything else that you throw at wine is, is an additive, whether it be oak, yeast, nutrients, acid, uh, fining agents. For me, those are all additives. And, and at some point, they're, they're rather superfluous. That's my, my, very short, my very short answer. But yes, we do use additives. Um, and I thought, well, something I'd like to discuss maybe a bit later on, if there's time, is, is the use of, of sulfur dioxide and what everyone's take is on, on that. But that's a, that's a very, very deep rabbit hole to get, to, to get involved in. Well, I certainly think we could, we could take the time now. If that's, a, that's an area that, that others have interest in as well. We, we certainly can talk about that. That is one of the additives that, that is uh, often debated. Yeah, well, I'd be interested, Ken, maybe, maybe you want to jump on a bit. What is your what is your sulfur regime and what what sort of sulfur levels are you are you looking for uh, post ferment uh, and going into the bottle? It's um it's all over the map. <laughs> uh, there's there's some stuff that's done with uh, with no sulfur at all throughout the whole process. Um, there are other places where sulfur is used with the with the materials that I first started with. Uh, after fermentation is finished and before bottling, 
and then there's everything in between. And and again, I think it's part of these micro decisions that that take place. If I if I end up with a source of material that I'm particularly excited about not intervening with at all, then it's a you know a non non additive sort of approach. If um, if I feel there's some some problems or issues, then maybe the sulfur is an idea that that maybe will help dampen some of that and and give me a result that's a little bit more stable and pleasing and allow the the character to show through. Um, as I've developed sort of a a better understanding of the procedures and processes, I think the the use of sulfur myself has become less. Well, it's 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 fluctuated. There were times early on in in my experimentation where I didn't use it at all, and then places where I ran into trouble. So then I started bringing back a little bit more, and then I didn't seem like I needed that as much, so I could dial it back a little bit. I like to split ferments or processes so that I have sort of a control, and so I'll put off you know a portion of it, not hit it with sulfur. If it falls apart, well, then that was a good choice I made to put some sulfur in the rest of it and retain that. Um, so I, I'm, I'm like somebody said earlier, this is a, it's a process, it's a continuum. This isn't something that you just do over and over again. Every single time is a new experience. And I continually try to learn. And, and part of the excitement for, for discussions like this is to see what other people are exploring and, and finding out and, um, and discovering. It's amazing to me that with all the wine that has been produced for so many thousands of years, that a lot of this isn't worked out in any sort of standard ways. That's, I think that's, that's part of the diversity of, of what our species is all about, what we bring to it all. Yeah, just a comment on, uh, I guess early in our adventure, I, I think we treated sulfur just like the textbooks would tell us. Uh, 50 parts per million or whatever the specification was, we would, I think, really try to be very diligent that way. But let me uh, maybe suggest that Ethan can comment because I think we have a very different approach on uh, uh, sulfur at this point in time. So maybe you can, you can comment. Yeah. So, I mean, well, I'll start with the kind of the more general comment. You know, I, th I would say I agree with Craig that, you know, if, if, we're, if we're talking grape wine, the, the, the only real ingredient needs to be grapes um and at shelburne you know we have we have a line of wines that that we do use some additives some finding agents uh some yeast some uh you know higher levels of sulfur uh but then we also have a line of wines where we you know don't use any you know don't have anything other than grapes um some of the some in that line you know we do use a, a touch uh, of sulfur, but for me personally, in terms of my winemaking philosophy, I, I don't come hard. Well, I don't really come down hard uh, on any on any topic. You know, I, I I don't like to draw lines in the sand. I find a lot of truth in the in the gray areas, but you know, on on either side of on either side of the argument, and I just take more much more of the like the uh, I don't know maybe a realist approach. I mean, if a wine if you if you, as the one responsible for the for the wines, um, feel like the wine is going to benefit from a little sulfur dioxide, and when I say a little, I'd maybe be talking like you know, I don't know, under 50 ppm total. Um, and so, if you feel like it needs a little bit, either post fermentation or on the crush pad or right before bottling, you know, I think you know that that's the decision that you have as the winemaker and. We, we certainly, like Ken said, when I, when I had first started, I mean, I didn't know anything about making wine and we did, you know, we, we, been, we pretty much did kind of blanket sulfite additions. We checked it every now and, you know, every, every now and again and just kept it, kept it elevated. But as we've grown uh, and become better at what we do and, and understand, you know, our wines more and trust ourselves more, you know, we have, we've driven our use of sulfur down substantially, even in the wines that have a higher level. I mean, it'd be rare for, you know, our, you know, our, um, our, any of, any of the wines that are, are dry, if they're dry and have gone through mallow, the sulfur is very low, 
you know, just whatever the pH would be to, to, to keep microbial levels um, subdued post bottling. For, for like whites that haven't gone through, you know, they might be a little higher, but even still, I mean, we're not talking much more than like 60 or 80 total. And so in our line, in our, in our line of wines, that's kind of more in the quote unquote natural style. I mean, you know, we either have zero, you know, zero add or 10, 20 PPM, maybe 40 PPM if we feel it needs it. But, you know, as a general rule, I think the less that we, the less that we add, the better. I think it also comes down to like what your target audience and customer is. Certainly there are people out there that don't want a cloudy bottle of wine. And so, you know, you might do some, you know, you might have to cold stabilize and do some fining for that particular product, which is all well and good. But if, you know, you want to make wine in a different style and have a consumer that's a little more forgiving or interested in, you know, you certainly don't need anything other than anything other than high quality fruit um and so you know my position on 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 sulfur is you know in in moderation personally i think it's or and used judiciously i think it's it's okay i'd rather do i'd rather add a little bit of sulfur or i guess i could say this about a lot of different components but like i'd rather have a wine that had a little bit of sulfur in it than that had you know way too much oak in it for example If I can add uh, my two cents to that, I, I agree with the sentiments of, of everyone, but I, I kind of look at everything as uh, a tool in my tool belt. Um, I agree that not everything is cookie cutter and should be made the same exact way or expected to. Uh, we have uh, to save ourselves time and money. We have on every one of our bottles that says contain sulfites because it's easier. Um, it doesn't mean we do that, but there are certainly times where it is warranted to use a tool like that. Um, you know, I find especially uh, certain, um, certain fruits uh, that are prone to oxidation, i.e. apples are a great example of that, um, but also some more of the susceptible fruits that, uh, you know, you're, you're going for. I think peaches are a great example of that as well because they don't tend to carry a lot of acidity um, and the pH is typically a bit more subdued than say a raspberry uh, and probably a grape. So um, I, I look at it and I come from it. I know the question is, is it, you know, an ingredient or is it an additive or an adjunct? I, I look at it as like building a house. You know, the hammer didn't make the house. It isn't an ingredient to a house, but I kind of needed the hammer to make the house, but every house is different. And I think that, traveling along that path and, and using that analogy, I think uh, gives at least newer winemakers or mead makers a little bit more hope and, and thought process in what they're doing and understanding that there's flexibility. Uh, I feel like in forums where we discuss mead making, uh, they're looking for this silver bullet uh, answer to making the best X mead um, and I don't think you can give that and, and easing up on the rules, but understanding what tools you have, you know, that old saying, if, if you have a hammer, you see everything as a nail. Uh, it's kind of that, that philosophy towards, uh, towards mead making. So, um, so it seems to me that there's a lot of alignment with all of us in this approach. And my question would be to, to the rest of you, do you feel that this is the norm in the industry or are we sort of anomalous in our approach? Are your other colleagues of the same format or are they more of this sort of textbook approach to control everything you go through, you, you hit it with sulfur, you find it this way, you stabilize it this way and you put it in a bottle and off you go? If I, if I may, I think Ken, that the, uh, I think don't, don't fix it unless it's broke mentality is a natural one amongst uh, uh, constituents. But I think that the, uh, the overall, I think the overall industry, at least in the mead world, I can't speak for the wine world, but the mead world, the majority I would say use sulfites uh, because not only is it a tool for stabilization, color enhancement or, or stabilization as well, 
It's also uh, an insurance policy if, if used properly. Um, if you're scaled and you're producing, you know, tens of thousands of cases a year, it's important to add that if you feel necessary. Again, you'd want to judge that for yourself. Um, but I think it's also a tool in that it's a small insurance policy to ensure that you're not buying back pallets of product from all over the country or the world. Um, Kenny, I think there's a spectrum, you know, as, as you know, we, I think it's safe to assume that, you know, I mean, I, I have plenty of colleagues that are only working with, you know, grapes and sulfur or, or not even that just grapes. Um, but then I also have plenty of colleagues that are somewhere along the line. I would say, I think most producers are, are not the, you know, most produce, if we, if we think about it on like a, a, a number of, or yeah, the number of producers, I think more people are working using less additives, um, but on like a volume basis, there's a heck of a lot more wine out there that has got, you know, all kinds of stuff in it. Um, and so it, it kind of depends on which one you're looking at. But I mean, in, in my closest circle, I think it's, it's, it's more people, you know, working towards less um, additives or, or none at all. I think you could also differentiate between those producers who are creating sort of a craft, a craft product versus a commodity. Uh, as you said, there are, there are some very large wineries that are making wines that are being transported around the world. And, and I think most of us would agree that those are very different products than those that are created uh, more or less by hand by, by you folks in small settings in, uh, in, in small regions of the, of the world. So Craig, um, since you, some of your products are shipped around the world, do you, do you handle how you stabilize a wine differently for the, for the, for where it's going to go? Um, not, not so much where it's going to go, just knowing that it is going to travel. So yeah, around 70% of our wines do end up, uh, abroad and generally in, in Europe and a bit to the U S and, and that trip alone can, can really ruin a wine if it's not, uh, if it's not properly stable going into, into the bottle. So yeah, we, we do stabilize the wines. We take, we take great care in stabilizing all of the wines. And, um, I don't use huge amounts of, uh, what you guys would call additives. Uh, I, I do try and keep, uh, and this is getting very technical, but I do try and keep my free sulfur levels and my total sulfur levels as close to each other as possible. And I think, I think it's all about timing. Whereas I think so many, so many winemakers are in such a rush to get their wine sulfured up straight after mallow. And I think what that does is it leads to incremental um, amounts of sulfur being added. So you end up having this monster with, with, potentially, you know, 150 parts of sulfur per million, which in my opinion is just, is just far, far too much. Um, whereas we, we tend to wait with our red wines about a year before we add any sulfur. Uh, we let the, the malolactic fermentation happen completely naturally over a very, very long period of time and only sulfur up after that. And that's pretty much the only sulfur addition that the wines see. And what I've seen since we started doing that is that we can literally put a bottle, uh, put a put a wine into bottle, a red wine with a total sulfur of around sixty parts per million, and the free could be anywhere sort of between thirty and forty, which is a huge result. It means that you know most most wineries, if they were trying to get a free sulfur in a red wine of uh, of thirty to forty parts per million, their totals are probably sitting a hundred plus. Okay, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna sort of sum this up a little bit. Uh, my my thinking or reasoning for bringing all of you together today was uh, maybe somewhat selfish um, in that uh, you know years ago when I first got introduced to wine, I like a lot of people uh, understood wine to be something made from grapes in a handful of regions around the world. The wine was made in France and in California and Italy and 
and uh, and that's all I knew wine really to be. Um, but since I've partnered with Ken and Chuck, and we've ventured off on this this exploration that we uh, we've called Hermit Woods, and uh, decided to open a winery in an area where the classic grapes that are grown in the wine regions of the world are no longer or are not able to be grown. Um, we were challenged with how do we pursue this interest of ours in a way that's meaningful, that 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 speaks to the terroir of our area and is uh, uh, something that you know is not about just transporting grapes around the world, but is about about us and about what we what we want to call local for us. Um, so we've been on this exploration to discover what else is fermentable and can be made into a wine. And as we've had some success in this, uh, in exploring all of the different types of fermentables that we've worked with, um, I've come to realize over the years that, that it, it really matters much less to me now what the ingredients are in the bottle that I'm drinking, but much more so um, when I taste something, I don't care what it's made from, that just strikes a chord. Some of you talked about what, what defined a, an exceptional wine in the beginning, and you really hit on some important areas. And when I taste a, a, an exceptional wine, it doesn't matter what it's made from. It's, it's, uh, it's creating something special. It's a special feeling in me, and it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's unique. And it's... Um, so... I, and that's part of why I wanted to have all of you here today, because you're all sort of from different parts of that world. Some of you working with vinifera, the classic grapes, you, you down in South Africa, Craig, and, and uh, you folks in Vermont, uh, uh, Kenneth and Ethan have had the challenge, uh, vinifera doesn't grow there. So they've, they've had to work with other styles of grapes and uh, that, are, that are actually becoming more popular in the world in the last 20 or 30 years. And, and thanks somewhat to the efforts of, that you guys are putting into it. And then, and then of course, Ash uh, exploring the world of meads. But I'm sorry, when I sit down and I have an opportunity to try an outstanding mead or an exceptional blueberry wine, if you will, it matters not that it's made from blueberry or honey. What matters is, is that it's creating something special. And I'd just be interested to have all of you speak to that issue just a little bit before we close. I assume that everybody here has has had the opportunity to explore meads and wines made from things other than grapes. Maybe I'm I'm wrong. Yeah, I, th I think you I think you pretty much um, yeah I think you said it well. It's 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 these these beverages that we're talking about are you know rarely are you consuming them you know in an isolated manner, right? So if, if you're gonna drink something, you know, either with a meal or with friends or family, I mean, it, it, that's what becomes more important than, you know, specifically what is in your glass. Well, you know, whether it's mead, blueberries, apples, grapes, you know, that's just a, that's just a detail that in, that in the larger picture, um, is an important one and one that you want to be uh, a positive detail, but it's just that it's just a detail. Um, and so it's that really, it's really that, that experience that I think is, is, you know, becomes the most important thing. One of the, one of the things that I hope we could cover here before we, before we close, just to hear from each of you on sort of your, your forefronts. What is what is most exciting coming down the, the pike with Marquette? What's super excited about honey? What's happening? I heard a little bit before Craig about you know semillon and and picking and, and fermentation. So what's what for each of you is really exciting over the next few vintages? Well, I'll quickly answer that, Ken. Yeah. The most exciting thing for me is a, is a new project that uh, that I'm embarking on with uh, with my now business partner Clayton from uh, from a winery just down the road called Morrison. Um, we're sort of starting this venture where we're trying to make wines that are really outside of the box. So we both come from fairly traditional wine backgrounds in terms of the the wines that we make for our particular brand, 
um, and this joint venture of ours gives us a real opportunity to to spread our wings a bit and to do to do something completely completely different. So yeah, we're we're experimenting with pretty much low alcohol wines. We're doing a like eleven and a half percent alcohol semillon, a lowish alcohol chardonnay, but a chardonnay that's fermented uh, on the skins in amphora. So going back uh, you know, many hundreds of years and actually protected instead of using sulfur dioxide. Uh, to preserve the wine, we've used olive oil. It's also a very, a very old technique. And then the last wine is a, a low alcohol, but heavily skin extracted Cabernet Sauvignon, which I've actually got in my, in my wine fridge at the moment. And I need to go and start tasting it uh, this evening to start giving my, my notes, because that's going to be going into bottle fairly shortly. So yeah, that's, that's for me is, is the most exciting thing that's happening, uh, happening at Aspa. Can you, can you remind me again about the maceration time on the skins of that Cabernet? I think it was something quite long. Yeah, it's ridiculous. It's, it only came off the skins last week, Friday. So where are we now? It's, it's the end of May. It, we harvested the grapes in January. So February, March, April, almost four months of, uh, of skin contact. And like I said, no sulfur in that wine up, up until now. Um, so we really are pushing pushing the envelope and trying something completely different, but trying to make wines that are still sensible, not just different for the sake of being different, different because they work and the wines are actually delicious. To, to add to that, um, and not to interject here, but uh, in November, I was at SOMCON in San Diego and I was on a panel there and uh, while I was there, I learned about uh, amphora and the olive oil technique. What, and what Craig was mentioning is in those days, they would, they would cover the top of the, the wine with oil to keep it from uh, exposure to oxygen. And um, that's actually something that we're talking about or uh, that's been written down in a, in, as a productive or production idea. Um, so I'm fascinated to see how that works out for you, Craig. I, I'm going to stay tuned to that process. I look forward to that. Ethan, what, what exciting things are you looking forward to in the years to come? Um, well, I, as it, it's not going to sound terribly interesting, but I mean, we've only, I've only now made, you know, maybe 12 vintages of of wine working with with these varieties and so that isn't very long and you know the first half you know easily the first half of those was was kind of just scratching my head you know trying to figure out the the real um obvious things and so i'm just looking forward to you know working with vineyards that are now uh maturing uh we just picked up a new site uh maybe 20 miles south of of uh of ours, um, so interested to see um, what the fruit's going to be like from that vineyard, um, and then just continuing to to push the envelope of of um, grape growing in Vermont, and continuing to 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 work towards you know changing changing the people's attitudes around hybrid grapes, um, and really starting to to bring them you know to 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 get them the attention that that they deserve. Let me ask Craig and Ethan, do either of you ever feel inspired to ferment things other than grapes, honey and blueberries, maybe? I've never really had the opportunity, Bob, but yeah, something that, uh, that's fascinated me, because I haven't tasted too many meads. I think I've, I've tasted mead once in my life. A friend of mine makes, makes mead every once in a while and gave me a case of mead as a, as a wedding present. Um, but uh, yeah, fruit wines, I think I've only tasted two or three in my life. So there's not a lot of inspiration to be had from my side. It's not really, it's not really a big thing in South Africa, but maybe, uh, maybe that can change. To, when I was, to, oh, in, sorry, to inter interject, Craig, in South Africa, there is a meadery. It's called Ikalika and it's Makana Meadery. Uh, and the, the gentleman that started that, his name is Dr. Garth Cambrai. And he uh, licensed, a, I don't want to call it an invention, but a process of fermentation that is a continuous process. It's a continuous fermentation. And it looks like giant glass test tubes on the wall. And there's yeast in all of them. And they pump through those test tubes 
uh, the honey and water mixture and within 24 hours on the other end is uh, a completely finished or fermented honey and water. Uh, you oh. should take a look at that. And that's right in South Africa. I know that's a big, big, uh, big area, but I know there is uh, the ability to look into it. Cool. I've, I've actually got God's number on my phone. I'm part of a couple of WhatsApp groups with him. So I'll, uh, yeah, I'll definitely go and check it out. Thank you. Uh, when I first started, you know, fermenting things years ago, I had fermented pretty much anything I could get my hands on, but honestly, none of it came out very well. And then once I got into grapes, that's, that's really been my, been my focus and my passion. So I, I wouldn't say that I'm, it's not that I'm not interested in fermenting other things. It's just, I, I haven't made the effort to, to really diversify. I think, I think our next move um, so I make, I make a lot of fresh cider in the fall every year with friends and, and have recently started getting back into hard cider. So I think in terms of other fruits other than grapes, apples would, would be, you know, kind of the, my next, uh, my next move. And certainly Vermont has got lots and lots of apples. So, um, but man, but mainly my, my, you know, my focus has been on, has been on grapes and that's, that's currently where my trajectory is going to keep me. But May may start to, to to experiment a little bit more. Thank you. I, I, uh, I we've been at this for about a little over an hour, and it probably makes sense to sort of bring this to a close. So, uh, I'd like to before I do bring it to a close, just ask each of you to make a final comment on the conversation, uh, express thoughts or ideas that that uh, that you that didn't get shared that you think should be shared before we close. Why don't you go, Ken? Okay, when you say Ken, it's dangerous here. <laughs> uh, just, just Ken, we, we could do a chorus. Uh, <laughs> so I, my observation is, I, I think we're all involved in, obviously, the, the, the craft focus. In other words, not just taking a commodity and, and uh, making a drinkable beverage out of it, but making some kind of a distinguished beverage that that you can, you can talk about and compare it to others and uh, say yeah this is different and this is what I like about this one and this is what's interesting about the other one and I think that's part of the magic of what we do uh, as I say when, when when I think when I started at least and, and Ethan as well you know we we basically learned uh, by actual experience and uh, the more experience we get, I think the more willing we are to uh, also go off in directions that are, are less traditional. And, and some of them really work out. I mean, we've made some wonderful uh, skin fermented white wines and we never would have thought of doing that 10 years ago. So uh, I think the adventure continues in, in that manner. And by the way, thank you very much for bringing us all together. I think this has been a very nice and, and fun experience. You're welcome. Thank you. Ken? Yeah, I just want to say thanks to all of you for, uh, for taking the time out of your, your busy schedules when we could have uh, the, uh, be making wine and, and doing all that that we enjoy so much. And um, hopefully we'll get a chance. This will, this will act as a catalyst for you know, cross-pollination between all of us. I know that um, meeting Craig five months ago was, was great and we've had the opportunity to carry on the conversation and uh, worked, had the, uh, had the fortune of working with Ash for, for many years now. And Ethan and Kenneth, um, I look forward to the future where we can interact and um, we, can, uh, we can share, share more ideas together. But uh, thank you all, it's been a great time. Craig, any parting words? Yeah, I think just for, for those people who are watching, it's, it's quite easy for us as people directly involved in the process to get quite carried away with the technicalities. And I think we need to always remember what you were saying earlier, Bob, and that what we're doing and what we're producing is supposed to be completely hedonistic. So for all the, for all the hours and the sleepless nights that go into producing this stuff, it is just there to be enjoyed. And I think people do need to remember that. Oh, and uh, for yeah, Ash and Ethan and Kenneth, if you guys are ever in South Africa, please do hit me up, and please, more importantly, bring some of your uh, bring some of your product so that we can we can taste it. Ash, do you have some parting thoughts? 
Uh, well, first and foremost, Bob, thank you for, for hosting this event uh, and, of course, bringing all these wonderful people together. I look forward to the day that I get to meet all of you, and I hope that my travels take me uh, to Shelburne and also to South Africa. I think that would be absolutely amazing. Uh, I was envious watching Ken, Chuck, and Bob make that trip, and I think uh, I learned a lot watching. I'm sure I, I missed out on some key details, but just watching it was absolutely amazing. Uh, so what an experience. Um, I just wish you all a lot of luck, you know, the crazy times right now, but I wish you a lot of luck. I wish you great health and I really appreciate each and every one of you. And I also appreciate everyone that took the time out of their day to watch us ramble on and geek out with uh, the things we love. So thank you all very much. Chuck, do you have a parting word you'd like to share? Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with everything that 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 everybody has said here and in the parting statements. And I kind of come full circle to, um, you know, the, this sort of juxtaposition of the isolation that we have with the, the pandemic and the local uh, creativity that you all express um, working in, in your individual environment with your product, making something that every 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 time around is there's a change in how you look at things and how asking the question of how how we can do this differently and then what are we missing what can we add to this to to do something different next year um i certainly know that's been our process at, at hermit woods and uh, i really i really love that because then when we go to south africa and try this this amphora wine or go over to shelburne and have some hard cider or whatever it is, you go over to, to Ossipi and, and well, it's always interesting um, at um, Sap House. Uh, I, I think that those are the spice of life. I love those experiences. I love that, that the experience evolves for you as winemakers and um, that really as a consumer is um, uh, part of the fuel that, that drives me to want to be a part of what you guys are doing. So, so keep it up and, and thank you, Bob, for putting on this uh, presentation. I'm sorry. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, Ethan, you want to uh, offer your last word on the subject? Sure. I won't say much, but yeah, thank you, uh, Bob, for, for organizing. It was great to, to chat with everybody. Um, it's just been really, really, or yeah, it's been interesting for me to, to, to just get a sense outside of the wine world with, with Ash and, and Ken specifically. You know, the, the, you know, I can, I, I'm guilty of kind of getting caught up in my, you know, my insular world of, of grape wine. And so it's, it's good to, you know, to, to step out of that and, and get the perspective, similar perspectives from other producers, you know, making, making different, um, making different products from different, from different um, fermentables, um, but sharing that similar philosophy and, and kind of battling maybe this might be, this is an assumption uh, on, on, on your behalf or on my behalf toward, towards the products you're making. But similarly to, to hybrid grapes, you know, I, I don't know, I don't know specifically because I don't have the experience with, with fruit wine or, or mead, but you know, sometimes I think my assumption is that the consumer perception would, would be, um, you know, could, could be maybe slightly negative. I know it is at least for hybrid wines and it's, it's interesting to, it's just nice to talk uh, and, and kind of all be working towards that goal of, you know, really making, really being committed to, to our products and, uh, and, and changing people's minds and opening people's minds to, to all that that's out there. Well, I would also like to thank all of you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to, uh, to join me today. This has been a, a really interesting conversation, one in, of which I hope continues in some form or another, maybe someday we can join each other again in this format. I certainly hope that each of you as individuals uh, will continue your conversations independently from this. And uh, more than anything, I look forward to being able to have this conversation with you in person at your, at your place. Uh, uh, as Chuck sort of mentioned, one of the things that's most amazing about this experience for me is, is the adventure of having the opportunity to, to try things from all parts of the world. Um, we often say at Hermit Woods Winery that the best wines in the world are those wines that you consume within a few miles of where they're made. And 
I think is the case with, with uh, most of us here, or all of us here, with maybe the exception of Craig, whose wines are traveling a little bit more broadly than, than some of ours, but uh, almost all of our wines are consumed right here in New Hampshire. And, uh, and so if you want to try Hermit Woods wine, mostly you're going to have to come to New Hampshire. So uh, uh, there are exceptions, of course. But, um, but anyway, it's been, a, it's been a real pleasure. And uh, I'm just going to say a few words to our, to our guests. Um, thank you for joining us today. I hope you've, you've uh, gleaned some, some interesting information from what we've shared with you. And uh, if you have had questions, I apologize, we haven't had a chance to get to those questions today. There's just been too much conversation going on. But like I said, um, I hope all of our guests and certainly myself will get to any questions you might have. Uh, so if, you, if you'd like to, uh, to type them in the comment section, we will, we will all uh, make, a, make an effort to get to it. Um, and when this broadcast is finished, we will be, uh, you'll be able to continue to see it as a replay on Facebook. And we're also going to be placing it on YouTube. So it'll be uh, available on our, on our website as well. So again, uh, thanks everybody for, for joining me today. Thanks all of you out there in the world for, for uh, visiting our presentation. And I hope everybody stays safe. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you all again in person, in our tasting rooms, wherever you are around the world. So have a good, good day, everybody. Take care. Thank you for watching our video today. If you have any comments or questions, please leave them in the comments section below. If you would like to see more videos like this, click the subscribe button or visit our webpage to see a list of all upcoming events and watch previously recorded interviews and presentations. From all of us here at Hermit Woods, thank you for watching, be well, and stay safe.